Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be with you today and to talk about alopecia areata. I'll be talking about some specific features in trichoscopy. Then I will focus on the treatment of alopecia areata in adults, and I will shortly address the treatment of alopecia areata in children. But before I do this, I would like to greatly thank uh, for the invitation my friend uh, Asan Farag and my dear friend Hoda Monet. And also, I would like to take the opportunity to say hello to all my dear friends in Egypt. I regret that I cannot be today with you in person, but I hope that I will be able to visit Sharm Derma very soon. I will start with a trichoscopy image. As you all, or most of you in Egypt, you are experts in trichoscopy, I will focus today on some very specific features, and I will devote only this one slide to basic information about trichoscopy of alopecia areata. And this image shows the most typical features of alopecia areata in trichoscopy, and these are the exclamation mark hairs, the yellow dots and the black dots. And if we see all these three features in one field of view, we can be almost sure that this is alopecia areata. But today I will be focusing on how to differentiate with trichoscopy some features which are specific or typical for alopecia areata from other diseases where these features may be also present. I will start with the broken hairs. The broken hairs are commonly observed in patients with alopecia areata, but they are not specific for alopecia areata. They may be present also in trichotillomania, in tinea capitis, and in many other diseases. What is uh, typical about the broken hairs in alopecia areata is that they are often hyperpigmented. If you take a look at the color of the hairs in alopecia areata, the broken hairs are often darker compared to the other hairs in the area. And here another image with some broken hairs, which are hyperpigmented. If they were not hyperpigmented, maybe you would not see these hairs at all. But here they can be visible by uh, the fact that they are darker compared to the other hairs in the area. Few words about the exclamation mark hairs. We learned that the exclamation mark hairs that they are typical for alopecia areata. However, they can be found also in other disorders, for example, in trichotillomania, which is very difficult to differentiate from alopecia areata in some patients and especially in some children. And the exclamation mark hairs may be present in some other disorders, especially in drug-induced alopecia. But let's look at the exclamation mark hairs in these diseases. So let's take a look at the typical features of exclamation mark hairs in patients with alopecia areata and in trichotillomania. Let's take a look at this exclamation mark hair in a patient with alopecia areata and, for example, at this exclamation mark hair in a patient with trichotillomania. Are these two exclamation marks exactly the same? No, they are not. The exclamation mark hair in the patient with alopecia areata will have two typical features. For example, in most cases, it will have a sharp end, a sharp distal end, and second, it will have a darker distal part and a hypopigmented part at the base. And this is usually not the case in patients with trichotillomania. Here are a few images of my patients with alopecia areata, patients who are at a different age and a different stage of the disease. But the common things about the, the common thing about the exclamation mark hairs is the fact that they have a darker distal end. And also, unless the patient shaves his hair, then in most cases these hairs will have 
a sharp distal end. We may ask ourselves why the hairs in patients with alopecia areata, why the, the exclamation mark hairs have a sharp distal end. And this is the case because patients with alopecia areata and in fact with any type of allergen effluvium develop the so-called polpincus constrictions. These are the constrictions along the hair shaft and these constrictions are the weak point of the hair so the hair will break within the constriction and then the distal end or the end of the broken hair remains very sharp. So this is the case in patients with alopecia areata, but also in other types of anagen effluvium, especially in chemotherapy-induced alopecia. Another thing to consider are the yellow dots. The yellow dots, we all know, they may be present in alopecia areata, but also in many other diseases, for example, in allogenic alopecia. So a single yellow dot does not make the diagnosis of alopecia areata. However, when you take a look at these images, then what is striking that in every image we will see multiple yellow dots, either a whole field of view full of yellow dots or many yellow dots at a site where there are still some hairs. So what is typical in alopecia areata that you will usually not see one or two yellow dots in a field of view. Usually these are many. And for myself, I have a definition that if I see more than, yellow, uh, more than 10 yellow dots in a field of view, I may consider uh, alopecia areata as one of the differential diagnoses. So today I touched on some specific features of some structures, trihoscopy structures in alopecia areata on the exclamation mark hairs, the polpincus constrictions, the, the yellow dots, uh, I was not talking today in detail about basic trihoscopy of alopecia areata because I know that most of you are experts, but if somebody would like to look at the basic trihoscopy of alopecia areata, I have some YouTube uh, videos available for you, and also you can just look basic alopecia areata trihoscopy, and there will, you will find uh, an instruction on how to make basic diagnosis of alopecia on the basis of trihoscopy. Today I will touch very shortly on how we can predict on the basis of trihoscopy whether or not the patient will have hair regrowth. And what we found in our recent study is that the trihoscopy image at the beginning of the treatment or before treatment is not reliable for predicting the hair regrowth. We have to perform trichoscopy approximately two months after starting therapy to be able to predict whether or not the prognosis for this patient and for this treatment is good. And there are some features after two months of therapy which are positive and negative predictive factors and the negative predictive factors are exclamation mark hairs, tapered hairs, black dots, and broken, do broken hairs. If you these see these features two months after starting therapy, this means that your therapy is not effective sufficiently and it would be a good idea to make a change in the therapy. If after two months you see some upgrowing hairs, some pigtail hairs, then this is a positive predictive value, a positive, positive predictive um, feature, and this means that your therapy was well chosen for this patient and you probably should go on without changing the therapy and the prognosis for hair regrowth is positive. Now a few words about the treatment of alopecia areata. There is no consensus about how to treat alopecia areata. We made a recent study with multiple experts from throughout the world 
And it turned out that everybody is treating alopecia areata differently. And doing a consensus study, we had a 5% on agreement in this consensus at the beginning. So this shows the diversity of treatment in alopecia areata. Before I tell you about my approach to the treatment of alopecia areata, I would like to point to the fact that, in my opinion, alopecia areata is either a systemic disease or a disease with systemic impact. Why? First, in patients with alopecia areata, there are multiple autoimmune diseases which may coexist. Second, in patients with alopecia areata, the cytokines, the pro-inflammatory cytokines are increased in the serum, what means it has a systemic impact. Third, in a patient with alopecia areata, if you have hair loss on the scalp and on the lower leg, this is more than local. So keeping this in mind, uh, my approach to treatment, and this is also in accordance with the uh, consensus, the international consensus, which was published this year. The consensus says that if the patient has a single patch of alopecia areata, then the best first treatment is intralesional tramcinolone, usually used at a uh, concentration of 2.5 to 5 milligrams, sometimes up to 10 milligram. In most cases, approximately every four weeks. However, our approaches to the time frames between the injections vary significantly. The injections should be placed approximately one centimeter between each other and of 0.1 milliliter per injection. Systemic glucocorticosteroids are another uh, type of treatment which has been placed into consensus. I am not a very big fan of corticosteroids, especially of big doses of corticosteroids in patients with alopecia areata, especially that I believe that, that the treatment in patients with alopecia areata should be very long lasting and probably it would be not my first choice to use a glucocorticosteroid. Uh, as for the consensus, uh, it is preferred that it is prednisolone or prednisone as a preferred choice, what means an oral type of treatment, and that the daily administration is optimal. And also, I prefer the daily administration as opposed to the pulse therapy, for example, every month. And the consensus says that we should taper the dose over approximately 12 weeks, but if necessary, I believe that this treatment should be significantly longer. In patients with uh, severe alopecia areata or an alopecia areata which is not responsive to the intralesional therapy, the systemic therapy may be a therapy of choice, and there are no very good data from clinical trials about the efficacy of different types of therapy, and especially there are now no head-to-head -head, uh, comparison uh, studies. So when pulling together the data which are available, uh, the, this, these are the response rates in patients with alopecia areata, whereas the problem is also that every study is defining the response differently. So these uh, data are not really very comparable. So this gives just some idea about the response rate. And also these data do not touch on the recurrence rate, which I believe is more a matter of the time of treatment than of the drug and of the dose. So I believe that when a patient has sufficient response to therapy, then the therapy should be long enough to avoid a relapse. In our recent study, we have made a meta-analysis of available data on the response rate to cyclosporine depending on the type of treatment, either cyclosporine in monotherapy or in combination with a steroid. 
and the pooled data show that cyclosporine in monotherapy has a response rate of approximately 57% and it is somewhat higher if we use cyclosporine with an oral steroid. But it has also to be pointed out that in most cases, cyclosporine was not the first drug in these patients. In my experience, uh, when I use cyclosporine as the first drug of choice in patients with severe alopecia reata or with alopecia reata, which is not responsive to intralesional therapy, then I see significantly higher numbers of patients who respond to therapy. So regarding the adjuvant therapies, uh, what the consensus is saying is that uh, cyclosporine should be used at a dose of 3 to 5 milligrams per day. I usually start with a lower dose of 100 milligram per day in a patient. According to the consensus, the preferable duration of treatment is 6 to 12 months. My uh, point of view is that this should be significantly longer to avoid a relapse. And uh, the consensus says that cyclosporine is or may be effective in monotherapy. In monotherapy, yes, this is true. However, uh, there will be more patients who will respond to therapy if we use cyclosporine in combination with a low dose corticosteroid. And according to the consensus, the methotrexate should be used at a dose of 15 to 20 mg weekly in adults as a subcutaneous or oral treatment. I agree with this. However, methotrexate is not my first uh, choice of therapy, maybe with the exception of children where I am more likely to use methotrexate compared to cyclosporine because in many other diseases, methotrexate has been proven to be a safe uh, or a, a type of treatment <clears throat> with a high safety profile in children. JAK inhibitors. Everybody is talking about the JAK inhibitors, but most of us do not have experience with the drug because it is extremely expensive. And I believe that as long as there is no reimburse treatment, treatment, we will only have some cases in clinical trials and some very few cases of patients who can afford to buy uh, the drug. According to the literature data, the treatment response is quite good. However, uh, also here we need to uh, think about the long-term treatment because if we use a short-term treatment of few weeks or some weeks, then the chance or the risk of uh, relapse is very high when we discontinue. And usually in these patients, the hair loss will be approximately uh, eight weeks after discontinuation of the treatment. One new uh, idea on the market is the low-dose naltrexone, used now in many autoimmune diseases with quite success. In hair diseases, we use low-dose naltrexone, especially in the patients with lichen planar pilaris as a good treatment option. And there's now an idea, mainly from the conference um, uh, reports, that low-dose naltrexone may be also of value in patients with alopecia areata or at least in some patients and as an uh, add-on treatment and not as a basic treatment in these patients. Six months. Six months is a number which we hear very often in uh, relation to alopecia areata. Six months is the time which we should allow for the regrowth when we start therapy. We should allow sufficient time, time for response because there are patients with alopecia areata who will respond to therapy after one, two or three months, but there are also the so-called late responders and we should leave enough time for the patient to respond. The treatment should not be discontinued or changed significantly earlier than six months. And the second number uh, in which the six months uh, is being used is the time which we uh, should use to discontinue therapy after hair regrowth. And many experts believe that after hair regrowth, we should discontinue treatment after six months, 
six months after hair regrowth. My opinion is that this should be significantly longer. In my opinion, it should be significantly longer than one year. Why? Because if we discontinue too early, then we are at high risk of a relapse. And the hair which has regrown is extremely fragile. And if we discontinue too early, we are very likely to have a relapse and the hair is likely to fall out. So I always leave sufficient time after regrowth and I taper down the dose very slowly to not induce a relapse and uh, to make sure that their hair regrowth is per permanent or as permanent as possible. Few words about the children. Uh, regarding the children, the consensus says that probably topical steroids or steroids are the treatment of choice, whereas in younger children, and especially if there is not so much involvement, the preference would be topical treatment, whereas in older children, especially with more extensive involvement of the scalp, then the preference would be, uh, would be systemic steroids, most probably, and or in most cases, these would be um, oral steroids. When looking at the response rate uh, in alopecia areata in children to various types of treatments, uh, this uh, graph shows the response rates. However, this, this graph has kind of limited scientific value because every study was different. Every study or every studies had a different number of uh, patients. So there are no head-to-head -head data to really compare the types of treatments. But what uh, comes to uh, mind when looking at this graph, uh, the topical steroids may be quite effective in patients, uh, in pediatric patients with alopecia areata. Uh, the JAK inhibitors, topical JAK inhibitors are not so effective, even though there is some response rate. The systemic JAK, JAK inhibitors are significantly more effective. But also when looking at the, of this graph, we can see that the systemic uh, therapies will give a generally higher response rate or chance for a response in the child with alopecia areata, with methotrexate probably being a drug at, which is currently with the highest uh, efficacy and the best, uh, best uh, profile in safety uh, in regard to uh, patients with alopecia areata in the pediatric population. We're waiting for more data about JAK inhibitors. Let's see, maybe by next year, this graph will change. So coming to the conclusions. Uh, there are not much new data in alopecia areata, but I did this presentation to show that there are some things in alopecia areata which we need to rethink. First, I believe that we should rethink our treatment goals in alopecia areata because if alopecia areata is a disease with systemic impact, both immunological and metabolic, then our treatment should not focus only on the local hair regrowth, but on the immunological and metabolic consequences of the disease. Second, I believe that we should rethink the response therapy, both in the wide aspect of not affecting the hair only, but also not defining permanent hair regrowth, uh, not defining uh, transient hair regrowth as a treatment uh, response. We need to have a long-term treatment response with cosmetically acceptable effect. The third thing, which is associated with treatment response, I believe that we have to rethink treatment time. Alopecia reata is a chronic autoimmune disease, such as uh, diabetes or such as psoriasis, and we cannot believe, or we should not believe, that a single course of therapy will solve the problem in the long term in every patient. There will be many patients who will require a long-term therapy and 
Well, thanks a lot for joining. Um, if you have any questions, uh, it is not possible now, but feel free to go to any of my uh, videos in my channel and you can just ask your questions in the comments to any uh, video. Uh, or you can just write me if you wish. And with this, I would like to thank a lot again for the invitation and I hope to see you soon in Egypt or in Poland. Thanks a lot.